Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today, we're going to talk about the five eyes of microbiology. No, not the five eyeballs, the five words that begin with the letter I that tell us how to grow, observe, and identify microbes in a laboratory setting. So stay tuned. Thanks for tuning in. Today we're talking about the five eyes of microbiology. The five steps that we take, all of which begin with the letter I, in order to grow, observe, and identify microbes that we have grown in a laboratory condition. So the five eyes really begins once you have a source of microbes. And its source of microbes could be pretty much anything. It could be environmental, for example, from a lake or a river, or it could be from your patient. So you could be taking a, uh, you could be taking a stool sample or a throat culture, something like that. The first step, the first I in this process, the first I is for inoculation. And inoculation refers to taking a small amount of a sample and introducing it into a growth medium. Now, in a previous video, you can see the link here, we talked about the different types of growth media that we use very commonly in laboratory conditions, in particular in microbiology labs that are studying patient samples. So you can inoculate on any type of media as long as it helps you grow the microbe in the right condition. So for example, if we're dealing with an environmental sample, we just want to see anything that grows, we might use a general purpose medium uh, like Mueller-Hinton. If we suspect that our patient has bacterial pharyngitis, then we might want to grow on a differential medium like blood agar. Or if we think that our patient is suffering from some type of gastrointestinal infection, maybe we may want to use a selective and differential media like McConkie or like EMB. Now, once we've introduced our sample, once we've inoculated our sample onto a particular medium, whether it's a solid media, uh, whether it's a liquid medium, uh, we need to do the next step. And the next I, the second I is for incubation. Incubation refers to growing microbes under optimal growth conditions. Now, very commonly when you use the word incubation, the first thought that comes to mind is temperature. And temperature is a very important factor when we're growing microbes. So just like all living things, all microbes have a particular set of what we call cardinal temperatures that dictate if, when, and how they'll grow. The three cardinal temperatures are as follows. You have a minimum temperature below which most microbes won't grow. They typically don't die, but they will enter into what we would call stasis, basically suspended animation, wait for conditions to improve. They also have a maximum temperature above which organisms again won't grow. Quite often, prolonged exposure to temperatures above the maximum temperature for a particular microbe are fatal. That's why heat, for example, is a great disinfectant. And then there is what we call the optimum temperature. And the optimum temperature is the ideal temperature to grow and culture microbes. We typically label organisms based on their what we would call their optimum temperature and where that falls. So for example, if a particular microbe likes it cold, likes it near the freezing point of water, for example, we refer to them as psychrophiles or psychrotrophs. If an organism likes it particularly hot, we then refer to them as thermophiles or hyperthermophiles. Of particular interest in our context, if we're studying things in, in particular in their relevance to human health and disease, we are most interested in organisms that are labeled as mesophiles. And mesophiles have an optimum temperature that's right around 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. As you can expect, most things that are going to be pathogenic to humans have to be able to grow and thrive around 37 degrees Celsius since that's the average human body temperature. But temperature isn't the only thing that we have to worry about. Because, the, because microbes also are particularly sensitive to gases. On the planet Earth, the gases that we're most concerned with, or the gas that we're most concerned with, is oxygen. Now, we have a particularly close relationship with oxygen. We are what we would refer to as an aerobic organism. We require oxygen in order to survive. It's part of our metabolism. And there are microbes that are aerobes just like us. But there are other organisms, other microorganisms, that have the exact opposite relationship. Oxygen is toxic to them. These are what we call the anaerobes. And when they're exposed to an oxygen-containing environment, they either don't grow or they die. And the reason for this is that oxygen is actually toxic. It's actually toxic to all living things in some capacities. The oxygen that we, use, that we need in order to survive, and all aerobic organisms need to survive, 
is actually harmful to the cells that use it. And one of the reasons why is that oxygen, when used in metabolism, can lead to the production of something called reactive oxygen species. These are, for example, like the free radical superoxide anion. Superoxide anions are free radicals. If you've ever heard of, uh, for example, people, people using uh, or, or read about uh, using antioxidants, that's what antioxidants do. They find free radicals and convert them into things that are less harmful. If you are an aerobic organism, you can both use and detoxify that oxygen. You possess two enzymes and uh, two types of enzymes in your body, superoxide dismutase, which actually takes that superoxide free radical, converts it into hydrogen peroxide, and then you possess an enzyme called catalase that then converts that hydrogen peroxide back into water. Almost every aerobic organism on the planet possesses those enzymes or at least contains something that has the same functionality. Anaerobes, on the other hand, can neither use nor detoxify oxygen. Oxygen to them is toxic. They do not possess superoxide dismutase. They do not express the enzyme catalase. And therefore, when they're in the presence of oxygen, their first response is to basically go into stasis. They go into suspended animation. If they don't do any metabolism, they won't encounter the oxygen and they, and, and they won't die. Some of them, for some of them, oxygen is completely fatal and exposure to them will actually kill them. They just live in the anaerobic parts of the planet. Believe it or not, there are actually more places on the planet Earth that, are, that lack oxygen than there are that contain oxygen. We just happen to live in the oxygen containing part, so we're a little bit biased. But there's a middle class of organisms. There is a class of microorganisms that can not use oxygen, but can detoxify it. Okay? Those are, in particular, what we would call the aerotolerant anaerobes. They are anaerobic. They cannot use uh, they cannot use oxygen at all, but they do possess the enzymes catalase and superoxide dismutase, which means that the presence of oxygen isn't harmful to them. They feel about oxygen the way you feel about nitrogen. The atmosphere is 78% nitrogen, and you don't care about it at all. And the main reason why is nitrogen doesn't hurt you, nor can you utilize nitrogen. Same thing for these guys. But there's a really awesome class of microbes that are called the facultative anaerobes, and these guys are really cool. Facultative anaerobes are classified technically as anaerobes. And the main reason why is they do not require oxygen at all in order to survive. E. coli is a great example of this. E. coli lives in your gut. It doesn't need oxygen to survive, otherwise it wouldn't live in your gut. But here's the cool thing. It possesses all the enzymes needed to detoxify oxygen. So it is tolerant of oxygen. Oxygen won't harm it, which is why E. coli can also live on your countertop um, and, and be grown in, in laboratory conditions. But here's the really awesome thing about facultative anaerobes like E. coli. They also possess the enzymes to utilize oxygen. So if oxygen is present, E. coli and other facultative anaerobes can go ahead and use it. If oxygen is absent, they just go back to their anaerobic metabolism and they're happy that way too. They literally have the best of both worlds. They're considered anaerobes because they don't require oxygen like all aerobic organisms do, but they can use oxygen when it's available. One great way to identify the relationship that microbes have with oxygen is to, do, uh, to grow them what we call a capped liquid broth tube. So the cap tube test is very simple. You take your organism, you put it into the liquid broth, you screw the cap down tightly, and you shake it. Now remember that when you screw that cap down, there'll be a little bit of oxygen tra trapped in that headspace up at the top of that tube. If the organism that you're growing is aerobic, it will grow right up near the top. You can picture yourself in a giant tube being shaken. Where are you going to be? You're going to be at the top with your head poking out, consuming all the oxygen that's available up there. You're not going to venture any way down, further down because there's no oxygen down there for you uh, to breathe and survive. Just below the aerobes, just slightly below the surface, you'll find a little band that certain organisms that are called microaerophiles will grow. Microaerophiles are a thing, they are aerobes in the context that they do 100% require oxygen. So they, can, they both require and can detoxify oxygen, but they don't like it at atmospheric oxygen concentration, which is 21%. They like it more in like the three to 5% range. Too much oxygen isn't good for them. So they'll live slightly farther down the tube. That's where they will grow in this little narrow band down here where the oxygen concentration is slightly lower. Oxygen is present, but not in high concentrations. Now let's go to the opposite of the aerobes. Let's go to the anaerobes. Where are they gonna grow? They're gonna grow only at the bottom of the tube. And the reason they're gonna grow only at the bottom of the tube is that is the only place in the tube where there is zero oxygen. That is where they're going to thrive. So aerobes are up at the top, anaerobes are at the bottom. But what if you have an aerotolerant anaerobe or a facultative anaerobe? 
Well, the answer is simple. They are going to grow throughout the entire tube. They will grow all the way up the top and all the way down to the bottom. And the reason why is they don't need oxygen to survive, but oxygen doesn't harm them. So facultative anaerobes, as well as the aerotolerant anaerobes, will grow throughout the entire volume of the tube. And depending on the results of this can tell you what the particular microbe you're growing, what its relationship with oxygen actually is. Now we can actually use uh, the ability of an organism to either detoxify oxygen or use oxygen um, as a way of sort of identifying it, a microbe. We can actually use the relationship with, with, with oxygen as a test. Um, one of the cool ways to do this is something called the catalase experiment. So as I mentioned before, if you are in any way tolerant of oxygen, you're going to possess that enzyme catalase that converts hydrogen peroxide into oxygen, I'm sorry, into oxygen and water. Um, the test is really simple. You take a drop of hydrogen peroxide and you put it on a slide. You then take uh, some of your sample, you put a glob of bacteria or wherever your microbe is into the hydrogen peroxide. If it bubbles, it's something that has catalase. It's releasing the, it's, it's breaking down the, the hydrogen peroxide and releasing oxygen and water. That's the bubbles. If it doesn't bubble, well, you probably just killed it. <laughs> uh, but also, it's because it's an anaerobe. You may have been told when you were a kid the reason when you put hydrogen peroxide in a cut, it bubbles. Oh, that's because it's working. No, it's because your cells are aerobic. They are using their catalase enzymes to break down that hydrogen peroxide and uh, release, release oxygen and water, basically, uh, as a byproduct of that, of that process. Now, oxygen isn't the only gas that we have to be concerned with. Um, there are certain things that we call capnophiles. Uh, they like higher levels of CO2. Um, so there's some of those. Some other conditions that we may want to consider um, uh, in terms of incubation, we may have things that are halophiles um, uh, or osmophiles, things that like high salt or, or, or high solute concentrations. Um, you have things that are what we call barophiles. So picture microbes that live at the bottom of the ocean. They are literally under hundreds or thousands of atmospheric or atmospheres of pressure at the bottom bringing them up the top would be like launching you into space where there is no atmosphere. Um, they have to be grown or cultured or maintained um, at high atmospheric pressure in order to survive. Um, so there are other characteristics, but if we're focusing mainly on those things that are um, that could potentially damage human beings that are potential pathogens in humans, the things that we're looking at, the things that we really care about are temperature uh, and, and their ability to use or not use oxygen. Those are the most relevant uh, things to consider when we talk about incubation. The next step in the process is isolation. So once you've inoculated and you've put it on the right type of media, uh, you then take that media and you grow it under the right conditions. The next thing you want to be able to do is isolate your sample. If we're going to hope to inspect and identify, those are the other two eyes that we'll get to in a minute, you need to make sure that you're studying this thing in a pure culture, i.e. a culture that contains only one particular species of microbe. Otherwise, you can get confounding results if you have a mixed population that's problematic. So one of the first things you would do with a potentially mixed population, you would typically grow it on solid media. You'd grow it on a Petri dish, on agar, and look for the individual colonies. Now remember, a colony is a cluster of nearly identical bacteria that are all the result of the same, all, all the byproducts of the same original mother cell. Um, and you can see them here on this plate. But if you look at this plate in particular, what you're looking at is a plate that has lots of different shapes and sizes and colors of colonies. Each one of those represents a different, an entirely different species of microbe. Well, we can't study a mixed population if we're hoping to continue to, and to eventually identify the thing that we're interested in. So the first thing we do is we, we grow them on solid media, we look at the colonies, and then we isolate them. Typically, we isolate them by either taking a single colony off of the original mixed population plate and streaking it onto another solid media plate, or we can subculture it and put it into uh, liquid media and grow it so we have lots and lots of it. Um, if you go back to our video on culturing microbes and microbial nutrition, you'll remember that liquid media produces, uh, allows for much more growth than solid media does. So it depends on what you're hoping to do. The next two eyes we lump together, the, the fourth and fifth eyes, inspection and identification, usually get lumped together. When it comes to inspection, typically what we're doing, we're going to be doing things like biochemical tests. We'll be figuring out what food sources can they ferment, what food sources can they eat. So can they eat glucose or uh, do they produce hydrogen sulfide as part of their metabolism or uh, are they aerobic or anaerobic, things like that. 
Uh, we also do things like microscopy, for example. Uh, we would do gram reactions and look to find out whether they're gram positive or gram negative. Uh, we'd look at what types of colonial formations they have under a microscope. Is it a staphylococcus? Is it a streptococcus? Are they rods? Are they vibrio? Uh, we look for the characteristics of them under a microscope. Or we can also do immunologic tests, things like PCR analysis uh, or ELISA. Uh, or, or fluorescent antibody labeling. All these different tests can help us to specifically identify. The key thing here is this. With inspection, we often have to run multiple types of tests in order to get a definitive answer. Once we have the results of multiple different tests, of biochemical tests, of microscopy, of, of immunologic tests, then we can get to the fifth I, which is identification. The bottom line is these five eyes are the five things that we need to do in order to identify a particular microbe from a given sample. Typically, we're talking about a mixed sample. It could be an environmental sample coming from a, you know, like a water sample, for example, or it could be a patient specimen, whether it's uh, from a urinalysis uh, or, a, or a throat culture or a skin biopsy or whatever. But we need to remember and utilize the five eyes in the right order and in the right process in order to do that. So thanks for tuning in to this video about the five eyes of microbiology. Remember, inoculation, incubation, isolation, inspection, and identification. Those are the five eyes. Those are the five things you need to do in order to identify a particular microbe from your particular sample. I hope you guys learned a lot today. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you guys next time.